we're back in the studio. It's nice to be here, man. It is nice being it's back. It's been a while. We got five signs that you're outgrowing either a particular relationship or even some of the people and relationships around you. Yeah, oftentimes people take this as a negative, like, oh, what's wrong with me versus it's actually what's right with you. Yeah, this is going to be a really interesting topic. And this is actually coming from uh, one of your recent lectures that you're giving actually for your class, right? Yeah, so we're covering like family and group dynamics and differentiation, which is like being your own person. So it comes from that lecture. Yeah, I love it. Dr. Glenn prepped the whole outline. He has this beautiful title. I'm like, dude, this is amazing. You're rubbing off of me, man. This is amazing. I appreciate it. All right, well, let's get into this. So welcome to 12 Week Relationships. This is your place for better relationships in weeks, not years. My name is Pi. I'm Dr. Glenn. Uh, Let's jump right into this. Actually, you know, before we do, I should say that we have an awesome newsletter. Go to 12weekrelationships.com, sign up for the newsletter. It's awesome weekly tips and insights. And we also just prepped a new guide. So we have a new guide, um, which we'll actually link it up in the description, that along with the newsletter. So if you guys are listening, we have a new secret to healthy relationships guide that uh, goes to answer. We, we keep getting that question of like, what are my core values? And we're like, well, it's kind of complicated. We actually spend 12 weeks helping people to you know, understand what they value and differentiate between trauma and attachments and all of it. But uh, I know that that answer is not very helpful. It's complicated. <laughs> so we made a guide and that guide is a free downloadable guide that will walk you through. It's a workbook as well. Um, it'll take you through core values, understanding our framework, all of it. Anyway, we'll link all of that stuff up. And now let's jump into today's topic. So five signs that you're outgrowing the people around you. The first one that you listed was differentiation and, and differentiation is actually the topic, um, that you discuss in class. So why don't you cover that material first? So, uh, when it comes to like dysfunctional families or dysfunctional group members, there's something known as differentiation. And most people like if, if you have high differentiation, you're able to be your own person and then yet still be a part of the group. But most people have low differentiation, right? So if something happens within a family dynamic or a group, they'll be like, what is the group going to think? Or what is the family going to think? And I'm just going to do what everyone else wants, right? That's low differentiation. High differentiation is something's not right and you're, you're able to separate yourself. You're like, I want to be a part of this, but I also want to make it better. And I also want to keep my individuality. And that person has really high differentiation. Mm-hmm. So if you have that and you're starting to see things apart from what's taking place within the group, you're actually starting to grow as a person and you're starting to become healthier. Yeah. One of the interesting aspects of differentiation, it's actually one of the best tools for children, right? Children that are growing up in like, um, well, I can, I can speak to my own example, but children that are growing up basically in two different households, uh, and you know, one of those households is not a healthy environment. This is the tool that you would use. You would help them. You would not speak bad about one place. You would simply help them to differentiate. These are the things that we do here. These are the things that are done over there. You need to understand the outcomes of each and and choose for yourself. Yeah. And in in that example, like, you know, you have to develop your own moral compass and who you are and what you value. Correct. So you're really teaching differentiation at that, at that level. Which is a very interesting process among children because they actually do. I almost think of it as like uh differentiation feels like a a double-edged sword because speaking away from the the children aspect right just as adults it's almost like yes you do want to be your own person um you want to be independent emotionally of the people that are especially in environments that are potentially unhealthy right but the outcome of differentiation yes you get to be healthier happier, more independent, but it almost always leads to that pulling away. So it's kind of like you're leaving, um, whether it's completely, whether it's partially with just boundaries, you're leaving the, the, this group of individuals that is, is not as healthy, but is something that you're accustomed to. Well, it's also people that you care about and that you love and you've built relationships with. So to be able to like, it hurts, like you said, it's a double-edged sword because number one, you, you're, you're actually being healthy about it and you're trying to make positive change and you're being responded to negatively about it and you're kind of being blamed for it. So it sucks, right? Mm-hmm. So you're like, what's wrong with me? The first thing is like, what's wrong with me? Am I doing something wrong versus, it, I know it's ass backwards, but it's actually a sign that, hey, you are getting healthier and you're outgrowing these people. Yeah, 
that's such a strange aspect of differentiation because we all want to grow, but at the same time, you don't want to lose the people that you've come to care about and love very much. But there is that distancing. There is that natural separation process that happens. And, and we can think of case studies. We can think of personal examples. I can think of, you know, examples of, from my own life where through that process of differentiation, you, you literally just lose the relationship. It, it, it is gone. And then you have other ones where, you know, the relationship is still there, but to a less intense degree, like it's not as close. Yeah. And from an emotional level, you know, most people, they try to like stay within that box, not disrupt it too much. And let's try to make this relationship work. But if it's really dysfunctional, you know, emotionally, like, oh, nothing else is going to work. I have to cross this line and I have to be willing to let that go. And once you start thinking that way, you have high differentiation. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of the first sign of like, okay, you're going in a direction that's going to potentially outgrow these people around you. Yeah. And even with kids, you know, the kids like, oh, you're the weird one or what's wrong with this kid. That's because that kid has high differentiation. They're thinking away from the group. They're thinking about themselves. So even though they're being punished as kids and they may internalize it, like something's wrong with them, it's actually something right with them. Yeah, that that one's very interesting too because we have you all you all you know that we have four kids, but maybe our our listeners and watchers <laughs> don't know. But uh, we have four kids, and and uh, our second to youngest, he is incredibly independent. Yes, like he is just it's amazing. Yeah, he he is totally happy just to do whatever you know he wants to do, play with Legos, do whatever. And there's a part that's like, well, when it's family time, it's family time. But then there's also another part that's like, you have to respect the independence as well. But I can very much see the inclination to like, kind of beat it out of the children. Not, not like actual literally, but mm -hmm. like to, to just say, Hey, you know, that's not okay. You need to spend time with other people. You need to do this. You need to, and there needs to be a balance of course, but everywhere like in in school in other areas he's labeled as kind of the weird one and i'm like it's always the weird ones that are going to do really great things it's there always is. the weird ones that are like i was a weird one you know i'm sure you're a weird one oh, like yeah. it's all the weird ones that are that learn differentiation when they're young that learn not to care about what other people think and it was incredible to see in him because nobody's taught it to him he just kind of it's innate is. But you know, one thing I appreciate about, you know, like watching your dynamic, you guys let him be who he is. And then I love his style. Like even the way, <laughs> even the way he like dresses and his clothes, like it's so original and yeah. there's like a confidence about it. Like I love that about him. But the other thing too, is you don't force it. Like when you're like, oh, it's family time, you know, you're not trying to conform and follow group think you're like, hey, this is time for you to engage. This is time for you to be a part of something. So you're teaching that balance. Yeah. We try to balance it. Which is great. Which is great. It's just interesting because with our other two children that are kind of splitting their time um, in one home, an unhealthy place versus a healthy place, we have to very much teach that form of differentiation, like deliberately, right? As opposed to with our second to youngest child, he just has learned it naturally. Like he, you could, he can come home from a day and say, someone said this, it wasn't very nice. And I don't think he's right. And you're like, Yes, yeah. that's absolutely right. Yeah. Whereas the other two, they're they're even older than he is. And we have to deliberately teach them differentiation. This is healthy. This is unhealthy. This is, you know, and, and it's it's wild to see because one of them just innately had it. Yeah, but I mean, even with your own kids, like if you think about it, because you have, you know, two fam two different houses, right, that they mm -hmm. have to go to. What if you gave like traditional advice and you're like, when you're there, you just got to do everything the way like you know don't think about oh, it just follow the rules and when you come back here just follow the rules you're teaching low differentiation outside it sounds like it's great advice right yeah. like yeah of course you just got to follow the rules but you knew better and you're like no kids like you have to be able yeah definitely be respectful but you have to have this differentiation of yourself and understand what's taking place beyond your environment yeah and that's what's getting them through that would be um that would be horrific it, it, again it's funny because it can sound like good advice right okay when you're there yes do everything that you need to do in that home to make them happy when you're here yes you follow all the rules and you do everything you need to do to make us like uh, maybe the way that i'm saying it doesn't sound healthy but <laughs> but either way you think that that's a a good strategy and and we're not saying the opposite of that which is when you're over there don't listen to what they're saying what we're saying is 
is, um, you know, when you're in that other space, you have to understand that adults make mistakes too. And sometimes we are emotionally unhealthy and we are in, in bad places and we'll say things from those spaces. And you literally have the conversation with them. Like when this type of thing happens, is that healthy or unhealthy? And they go, that's, that's unhealthy. And you go, okay. So when something like that happens, you have to understand that that is not your fault. And in a moment like that, it's important to say, you know, uh, mom, grandma, this isn't something that I'm responsible for. And I understand and I love you, but I'm not responsible for this. Yes. And that's what they do. Yeah. So they'll come back now and then they'll say, you know, so-and-so had a, uh, went off and I'm like, what, what happened? Well, we were on our iPads doing work and I guess they, you know, mom wanted attention, grandma wanted attention and we didn't give it to them. And then they started throwing books down the stairs and they started like, you know, screaming and shouting. And I go, so what did you do in that moment? I said, mom, this is unhealthy. Um, you shouldn't be doing that. We're going to continue reading our books. I go, perfect. That's all you do. You know, this isn't healthy. I'm going to keep doing something right. That still throws me off. Cause you're like, Oh, they're throwing books down the stairs that that's not the kids doing it. No, but <laughs> that, that's the crazy part is like, like Oh, okay. We, we talk about this a lot. We talk about how in unhealthy family dynamics, uh, it's often the children that end up becoming the, the parents. parents of the relationship. Yeah. Um, which is very unfortunate because it leads to other issues down the road that we have to deal with. The and, rescuing, like yes. you got to rescue me or I got to rescue you and you overextend and you have to save everyone. Yeah. That's not a healthy thing to teach. No. So anyway, um, differentiation is, is, a, is a very unique thing. And, and as you start seeing it in your own life, as you start kind of looking at, I'm part of a group, but I also am myself. That's kind of the first place to start recognizing like, okay, I'm growing. I'm going in a certain direction and the people around me may or may not be. Mm -hmm. What is number two? So number two is the people around you start responding to you negatively. So they'll be like, you know, Pi, you've kind of changed, man. Mm. There's something different about you. I, I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. I can't tell you how many times I've got that personally dude, like, in my own life, dude. Dude, you, you're not you're not like who you used to be. You're yeah. kind of like more serious now. It's not It's not as fun hanging out with you. The hell's wrong with you man dude i've heard that i think uh every decade of my life <laughs> like a group of people <laughs> have told me this yeah and it's the weirdest thing to me because again one of the principles of our relationship framework is change and growth yeah a healthy relationship requires change and growth this is what prevents it from becoming stagnant and boring and you know, this is what keeps the adventure. And, and if we're talking a romantic relationship, it's what keeps the passion alive. And yet, how many times do we hear, you've changed, man. Well, can I ask you this? Like when you first heard it, even before the frameworks, did you internalize it? Like, dude, something, something is wrong. Oh, with of me. course. I can, I can even remember back to when I first heard that statement. Like the very first time that I got that statement uh, was probably when I was 12 years old. And my best friend in junior high, I didn't really want to do the things, I guess my, my best friend in junior high, uh, or at least leading into junior high, he was very, uh, part of me wants to say mature, you know, but we like different things. He was getting like really into girls and like wanted to call girls all the time. And, and we were just barely becoming teenagers and, and, uh, he was super into sports and basketball. Um, funny how my best friend, first best friend is very similar to my, you know, you know, later in life. Are we going back to attachments anyway, right now? Yeah, Maybe it's like sorry. attachment. Anyway, <laughs> um, but at the time I just wanted to play games. I wanted to have fun. Yeah. I really got into a game called Magic the Gathering for those that are, you know, our age. Maybe they'll remember that, but I was super into doing nerdy, geeky stuff and I loved it. I, I really enjoyed it. So I started hanging out with other friends that enjoyed doing those things more and I started to gravitate towards them and Whenever this other friend would invite me out, I'd be like, oh, I, I can't really go or I can only go for an hour and I go hang out with him for an hour and then I go to my other friends and, and hang out. When he found out about it, uh, that was the first time where he was just like, you're you've changed. You're not the same person anymore. And I was like, I guess, but I just don't want to do the same things that you want to do. And like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And in that example, what 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 is he arguing? 
stay within the group and be who you were and follow and be a part of this versus Keep doing what you're doing versus yeah. like, hey man, you're, you're becoming your own person. You're exploring. That's awesome. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. Like I could see that you're changing and you're growing as a person. That's amazing. Isn't that so strange? Because in a healthy relationship, you very much encourage the other person's change and growth, right? Because I know that when you're doing something new, that also like next time we're together, I benefit from that in the sense mm -hmm. of like, it's more stuff to talk about. Yeah. I get to learn about the things that you're doing. Yeah. It in a healthy dynamic, it, it's not, I'm not forcing you to conform or to stay the way you are. Yeah. And it's celebrating all the successes that each, each other has because then it's, it's pushing each other forward in a positive direction. Totally. Versus, but then low differentiation, it's all about don't change stagnation. Too much change is no good. So we have to make sure that everything stays exactly the way that it is yeah. at all times. And that's what low differentiation means. Well, so it's funny because that next group of people that I used to hang out with, I was very close to them through junior high. And then in high school, same thing happened again. I just wasn't into as much of the same, like, you know, watching weird. Like we used to watch weird. I don't know if all teenagers do this, but we'd get like, whatever radar movies we could find, we probably would have gone further, but we lived in Utah. So radar was as far as you can go. <laughs> and then we'd watch these weird radar movies together. We'd do all these, you know, we'd play magic. We'd anyway, as I started going to high school, I grew apart from them as well. And then my high school friends, I grew apart from them in college because of my ambitions and wanting to push forward. It, it's, it's happened in every single phase of this, like movement period. But then the ones that have stuck around the friends that I've been friends with for, decades they are also changing and growing they're also their own individuals and we appreciate that about each other and even though the relationships are changing you're you can see the growth and the success so you guys are getting closer correct yeah it's a beautiful thing yeah when it's healthy it's it's great but then Fantastic. you know the hard part is recognizing like oh i am outgrowing them and these people that i love they're the ones that are unhealthy and it's being able to recognize that it also hurts to recognize that too, right? I mean, there's a part of us that that you want to stay close to those people. Those are important relationships. No, it's true. Like it shaped your life. It was it was an important part of your time. It doesn't mean that they're gone forever, though. It just mm -hmm. means that I can't stay in the same emotional space with you anymore. For sure. You know. For sure. Okay, so number three, we had um, this one was interesting because you start seeing that even the healthier interactions within that relationship are actually unhealthy. Yeah, so you're starting to see the whole dynamic in a more full perspective. So like uh, one of the clients I was working with, like such a kind person, like, you know, really hardworking, you know, businesswoman, but she would always like, oh, like, so I, I need a 5.30 appointment, but we, we're closed at five. And she would always like accommodate or like a family member would be like, hey, can you pick me up at the airport? Even though like that person wouldn't pick them up. Or like there's an expectation behind it and she would rationalize like, well, that's just a nice thing to do. And mm -hmm. this is what, this is healthy in and of itself. So I'll do it. But that wasn't healthy. None of that is healthy because it's taking, it's causing resentment. It's taking time away from the things that she needed to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's even, even what was considered healthy, she was recognizing, oh, this is still under the guise of people pleasing and over accommodating and overextending and rescuing. So she had to realize I had to cut all of these behaviors off. So it was like this light bulb moment of even when I thought I was being really healthy, she's like, I would go in and out of healthy and unhealthy. Even what she thought was healthy was like, oh, this is on the the lower end of my unhealthy. It's still unhealthy. Ding, 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 ding. I'm going to break all of it. Mm -hmm. And that was like the big, you know, aha moment for, and, and for me too, like everything that I did in my life around the people that I was around, like even the things that I thought like, oh, I'm really healthy right now. It was like a wake up moment everything that i'm doing is unhealthy yeah that's an interesting thought because what is the what is the other side of that though what's difficult about that is that you look at the relationship and you actually would go okay well the things that i'm doing these are positive things right these are healthy interactions but what we're saying is that if those interactions are causing you basically resentment if they're if they're things that are forcing you to stay away from the things that you need to be doing or want to be doing then it's really not a healthy interaction. It's it's an obligation. It's a feeling of like people pleasing of, I need to be there for that person, even though that person is not necessarily there for me. 
And that's what really brings the resentment piece about it. And that's what is probably the best sign that it's not a healthy interaction that we think it is, but it's not a healthy interaction because it's only a one way interaction, right? Agreed. But even like, okay, what about a statement like, what if me and you, like, you know, our relationship was dysfunctional and you're like, you know, Glenn, I have to pick and choose my battles with you. It sounds kind of healthy. That's what a lot of people say. I got, I got to pick and choose my battles with you. If you have to pick and choose your battles, how healthy is that relationship? Yeah, I hate that line. Which means you may th- you you're like, oh, this is a healthy thing to do. It's on the health. It's on the healthier end of the unhealthy, but in and of itself, it's still unhealthy. I I mean, I despise lines like that because right. I, again, those are very subtle manipulation lines that people use. Um, I have to pick and choose my battles with you. Is like you're very difficult and I'm accommodating you. Yeah. So I'm only gonna you know, argue for the things that really matter to me because you're not easy to deal with. So as much as that can sound like healthy communication, it is not at all. It is not, or, or when people are like, you know what, you know, Paya, you're blowing up, but it didn't affect me last week. It's a win for me. <laughs> really? That just means you're getting more used to the toxic behavior. Like, that's what I'm saying. So when you wake up and you're like, you're learning to accommodate unhealthy and you're becoming healthier about it. For sure. But in truth, all of it is unhealthy and you need to wake up and be like, damn, even what I consider healthy is not a, and that's that, you know, like with the couples, the arguing back and forth, like in session, and then the realization once they realize, oh, even what I consider that is healthy is really unhealthy too. Yeah. And then that moment of wake up, it's like, okay, cool. We have to do everything different now. And you're, then they start to shift. You're okay. spot on. It, it's funny because that's that's almost like the first step of when when someone in an unhealthy relationship starts. It's really interesting, especially from the side of like if you take one person that has been you know working on themselves and being introspective for quite a, some time, right? They're in a pretty good place. They're they're highly differentiated, and you take another person that is 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 unhealthy, and they've had a lo- a close relationship for a long time. And this person has constantly kind of manipulated this one and made, made them feel as though this is an obligation. The unhealthy persons, they start to see help and see, get support and all this kind of stuff. They will say things like, I'm literally in therapy because of you. Mm. I'm doing this so I can have a closer yes, relationship yes, with you. Yes. And then they'll come to you and be like, I have to pick and choose my battles that I fight with you because we can't be losing our, and so it sounds like this. um, It sounds so healthy and there's a conviction behind it. Like, yes, what I'm doing is so noble. Yeah. Like, oh man, you're going to therapy so you can, you know, have a better, but when you start thinking about it, you're like, wait, what the fuck? That's so, you're just accommodating this person and you're just staying in this unhealthy space, but cool, man. Do what you got to do. Yeah. Because in a healthy relationship, I would never come to you and say, we would never, you would never go to me or I would never come to you and say, I need to pick my battles with you, right? Yes. No, if it's an important battle, I'm going to fight it every we're, single we're, time. We're going to talk everything out. Yeah, everything. We're going to talk everything out. Yeah. And and if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to come to you and be like, you know, there were things <laughs> that I didn't talk to you about, <laughs> yeah, exactly. but though they didn't matter, <laughs> you know? I had to pick and choose. Like, well, if you have to pick and choose with me, what does that say about me? Maybe I'm like, have a temper or I'm, I'm difficult to talk with. I have to be introspective at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So that's super interesting because there was the one side of it where it's like, okay, um, a healthier interaction could be this, you know, the, the, the one way serving of the other person. We know that this is an unhealthy interaction because it's a one way interaction, right? I'm willing to take you to the airport. I'm going to help you with this. I'm going to, you know, cook food for you when you're sick. I'm going to do all these things to serve and support you, even though none of those things are returned. So it looks like a healthy interaction, but it's not because it's a one-way interaction. But the other side of that is the seemingly healthy communication and behavioral patterns that really denote we got some major issues. Yeah, like in that example, like, okay, yeah, that's really nice that you're doing all those things, but you're enabling this person. You're sacrificing your time and effort. How is that healthy? Yeah. Other than you telling me and with conviction and pumping your chest how noble you are. And it sounds great. It's an entertaining story, but it's still unhealthy. Well, yeah, and, and it happens both ways too. Like a, another great sign of this is a, an unhealthy interaction is, am I scorekeeping, right? Yeah. When I'm, you know, taking to the airport and I'm doing those things and then you refuse to take me to the airport 
let's say that you're busy or whatever it is. And I say something like, well, I always take you to the airport. Why can't you be there for me? Mm, then you weren't really doing those things because you wanted to. You were doing them because you expected something in return. First is like just consideration. Like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I can't take you this time, but yeah, let's let's do something next time. I'm in, I'm going to cook dinner or whatever. Like we'll figure something out. It's just a consideration that you have because you really appreciate the person that you're with. Yeah. Okay. Number four. This is a this is a big one. Um, you know that you're outgrowing the people around you when you're constantly scapegoated. Yeah. So once again, the in any group dynamic, whether especially in families, but like once you start to show more independence and you start to become stronger as a person, then the people with low differentiation they gang up together. So like usually like the, it'll kind of happen in dysfunctional space. Like people talk about each other, you know, so-and-so this, oh, they, you know, oh, they're coming. Oh, and then they talk to this other person. Oh my God. And then once a differentiation person comes in and they call things out, like what's going on here? Why are we doing this? Then all the people group together that have low differentiation. And then they say, you are the problem. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with you? You are the one that's causing all the disruption and pain versus anyone taking responsibility. And then they take all that energy that's, you know, this group thing happens, you change and you conform. And so there's like this conviction as a group to say, we're going to force you to change because they're channeling all of their low differentiation together to go against you. And then the person that's being attacked will often internalize it as something must be wrong with me. Uh, you know, what am I not doing? Uh, what, what's going on with me? Am I doing something wrong versus like, you know, if you, if you're, if you have high differentiation, this is hurtful, but do I want to be like them? Mm -hmm. Do I want to follow the rules that they're following? Are they healthy? If they're not, this is a sign that I'm outgrowing them. I need to set boundaries with them and I need to move on and make better decisions in my life moving forward. Yeah. I, I feel like I could speak to each of these personally. I feel like you've written this entire thing about me, but <laughs> <laughs> going to, uh, to not use my own examples throughout this the whole time there's a particular case study that i'm thinking about where you know a, a a woman who is grown up and completely on her own is a part of a family who very much scapegoats her as as the problem um and it's the entire family like the entire family kind of pinpoints that that she is the problem and her goal is oh, i just want to be closer with my family i just want to get closer with them i, I want to and it's important to understand that in an unhealthy dynamic, that that's not possible. And the question to help, you know, really realize this was in asking her back, well, to have a close relationship with your family, you need to do the things that they're expecting you to do. Can you do those things and be happy? And she said, no, no. Oh. And that should be the answer. Like, no, I, I, I can't do those things and be my own self. I can't, because what they're asking is basically you need to take care of mom. You need to take care of dad. You need to provide for, you know, brother and sister. You need to be able to do all these things. You need to live in this place. You can't live away from us. You have to live close and you have to do, you know, be there for, for everybody because this is what a family is. And you say, well, would that make you happy? No, I, 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 I couldn't live in that circumstance. So then the only way for you to develop a somewhat healthy relationship is to actually pull apart, create boundaries, and to allow them to come around to the new normal. Exactly. And then ultimately, it's simplifying what's being asked of you. So when you're being scapegoated, the choice is, are you going to have low differentiation like us and join, your, join the group, or are you going to leave us? And if you choose your differentiation and you're saying like, well, What's the, if you really think this out, okay, like, okay, well, I'm going to lower myself and I'm going to try this again. I know the outcome. I'm going to feel disappointed. I'm going to feel unhappy. I'm going to feel miserable. And I'm going to get back to the same space again, ultimately making the choice, do I stay or do I leave? Like, you know the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. Differentiation is basically saying, I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen because I never did this before. I know I'm leaving this. I know it's going to be really scary. There's going to be a lot of fear. But you're, it's like the next stage of your evolution. You're, you're choosing your independence and you're opening yourself up to better and new experiences, no matter how scary that is. And once you accept that, even though I'm scared and I don't know the outcome, I'd rather choose that 
over the same disappointing outcome over and over again, knowing that this is what it's going to be, even though I can tell myself, well, I'm not alone and it doesn't feel lonely. Once, once you're like, that's not good enough anymore. I'm going to go. Mm-hmm. That's when you're, you're, re- you're really ready to move on. Yeah. Okay. I think that brings us to kind of number five, right? Because number five is that you, you know, that, you know, you've, you've kind of pulled apart when your independence and your own health and your own, your own wants, like being authentic to who you are is more important than fitting in. That's what we're really saying. Yeah. And you're, you're just like, no, I, I have to be my own person. I have to live my truth. Even if I'm alone and it scares me, I'm going to do it. That's a, that's a difficult part of this entire process. I mean, I feel like I've been in this place so many times in my life and yet every time it's still difficult, you know, when, when you're the one that's scapegoated, when you're the one that's, you know, kind of growing and and outpacing and, and, and you're choosing to live this way and, and create more boundaries, it's painful because you're, you're letting go of these and it's not even necessarily letting go, right? Cause you don't, like most of my relationships, I'm not closing off. I'm not saying I'm not friends with you anymore. It's just that natural distancing that happens. And I, I wrote some of my friends uh, and I actually told you about this. I wrote some of them, uh, about a month ago. And I said, do any of you feel a sense of like deep loneliness from the loss of relationships from 2020 to 2021? Because during that time, it was, it was a very interesting time. There was so much shit going on in everybody's lives, right? With COVID, with all the political stuff that was happening, with everything. There was so much garbage. And because of that, we were very able, we were very quickly able to see, um, well, how do we each approach conflict? How do we approach problems? And, you know, maybe we're not as aligned as we thought we were. Like my values are really not your values. And this entire two year period kind of brought that all to the surface. So what a lot of us noticed was like the people that I think are, are friends that I've been friends with for a very long time, we're actually not really friends at all. We Mm -hmm. don't really share similar values. They don't support me. I don't support them and they're, you know, we can't even have discussions around things. And so I'm asking my friends about a month ago and I, and I say, do you guys feel like this sense of loneliness? And, and this is a group of, it's a text thread with five of us. Um, and all of us, uh, all of them go, yes, like, but they wouldn't change it, but yes, because in this time we have come to realize like, what are the actual relationships that are, are, are meaningful, which people do share our values or, or which maybe have like, I have a lot of, not a lot. I have a few close friends. We don't necessarily share all the same values but we respect them Mm -hmm. and we can use those, you know, differences to be able to grow and be able to see different perspectives. Right. But I would say the majority of these relationships over the past two years have kind of dwindled. We've, we've tightened up. All of us have tightened up these circles. Yeah. And that's when I think about it, I go back to number five, that your independence and your health is more important than fitting in because as much as it's painful, You wouldn't take it any other way. You wouldn't have it by going back. You wouldn't choose the alternative. Correct. And and like you said, relationships, when they change, especially if you care about people, it's painful. But I can speak for myself. What makes it most more painful is when I try to go back. True. So I would try to go back to my old behaviors. Like, oh, I'm in a healthier space. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to try and go back to these relationships and try to rebuild it in this healthier space. And then the realization, like, what the hell am I doing? I'm just lowering myself. I'm just setting myself to get more irritated. That's what makes it more painful versus I'm just not going to, I've left the space already. I'm going to function from this space and do my best to make it work. That's where it becomes a lot less painful because now I'm not like reliving the past. I'm just like creating a new present and a new future. And that makes it a lot easier to deal with. And basically, you know, in my own journey of life, it's it's just understanding. Like even when we have conversation, we're, we're talking about like work, right? When I explain the concept of work to you, to me, it's explaining differentiation. It's I'm following where the differentiation is highest mm. and I'm making that distinction. And I'm letting you know, like, this is the distinction for me because I'm, I'm going to keep my health and it's my way of trying to stay in that space. Mm-hmm. Does that, so like, it's always choosing that no matter what. And it's once again, it's not a loss. It's a letting go of a part of yourself that 
that's no longer you anymore. Like for me, the whole journey growing up was, you know, be a servant. So like, oh, you're so pleasant and you're so nice and you're so accommodating. That was my identity. And I was letting that identity go piece by piece in this journey of life to developing my independence where, you know, people would be like, dude, you've changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Kind of a dick now or whatever the case may be, right? So it's becoming this more well-rounded space. But then, you know, the relationships that come from it are much more authentic. Yeah. It's an interesting thing, right? Because when you create those relationships that are authentic to who you are and and you allow them to be what they are and you serve those relationships from a very different perspective. You serve those relationships from it's it's never scorekeeping. It's never about, you know, you know, you 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 literally do things for those people whether this is a a wife, a family member, whether it's, you know, friends. You do things because you want to genuinely do them. And it doesn't matter what the other person does. You know that it's a healthy relationship that that it's reciprocal, that they're going to choose to serve the relationship however they want to. And so those thoughts are never in your mind. The thoughts of like, well, I did this, they should do that. You know, I, I, I took them to the airport. I, I spent yeah. all this time. I've, I've had, you know, friends, close friends be like, you know, I know that it's valuable to you to have phone conversations. So I'm here to have a phone conversation with you. <laughs> And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? <laughs> if you're not having a good time with this, and then don't do it. Then don't do it. Yeah. Like I, I like to have conversations. If that's not who you are, then, then yeah. why are you telling me that stupid in a healthy relationship that, that, that is not a thing that happens. You don't point out what each person is doing for the other person. No, for, for sure. And then, you know, I think what you brought up is very poignant as your circle gets smaller. Yes. The more you differentiate your circle of people that are close to you gets smaller and smaller. But that's a good thing because you're becoming more true to who you are. It's not only a good thing, it's actually a required thing, right? There's a study done. You're going to know this better than I am, but, but there was a, a study done around like what is the maximum number of relationships that a human being can have? And they basically, uh, I, I, I I'm dumb because I literally just wrote about this and I forgot it. <laughs> um, but it, it kind of talked about like our, our friendship circle, like the acquaintances that we have, maybe 250 to 300. This is a number of acquaintances, right? Close friendships or, or like, let's say friendships, less than 100. Close friendships, less than 20 to 30. Um, within our immediate circle was like five to 10. Do you remember the, there have been numerous studies mm -hmm, on this. Mm -hmm. what, what was the law that was, um, it, it's a law that. Which one? It's so-and-so's number. Dunbar's Dunbar's number. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> the voice of God. Thank he you, speaks. Sir. Dunbar's number. I'm such an idiot. Like I'm sitting here. I bet there are plenty of people that were listening that were like, "Pi, it's Dunbar's number. Pi, <laughs> Dunbar's number. Pi." Anyway, I wrote a, a newsletter maybe like a few months ago talking about Dunbar's number, and and we're not talking about like your circle gets smaller. That's not only a good thing; it's the only place for it to go because. Mm -hmm of our own limitations, like our, our own limitations and just brain resources of like trying to maintain multiple relationships, it's finite. So if you can only have, and that's a, another interesting way to put it that maybe we should put this into a separate conversation altogether, but if you could only have 10 relationships, period, would you choose the people that are currently filling those roles or would you want healthier relationships within those 10 people? No, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Like who would sit at your table who would be that circle? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. maybe we'll end with that thought today. Yes. Meantime, thank you guys so much for listening, for being here, or if you're on YouTube for watching. Um, there are a number of ways that you guys can listen to the podcast. We're on all major platforms. But in the meantime, each week we write an awesome handwritten newsletter that goes out every Tuesday. And uh, it's fantastic. It includes tips and insights. It includes information when we do have coaching programs and all that. And you can join the newsletter by following the link in the description of the video or going to 12 relationships.com. We also have a new guide available. So this is a completely free guide that helps you to understand your core values, kind of our process and approach, our framework for relationships called the secret to healthy relationships. And that's available as well. We'll link it up on the YouTube video. Otherwise, if you guys go to Instagram, you can actually find uh, 12 week relationships. That's where we put all of our shorts and stuff. But in our bio, there's also a link to that healthy the, the secrets guide as well. That's such a cool 
thing to do because then it answers all your questions about core values. Yeah. And it's completely free to download. Um, yeah. It gives you a glimpse into what we do. Yeah. Meantime, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Peace.